Hello, good people. It's Rob Lee. I want you to look at a picture here. I got these three flags here. This is the Southern States flag, what many people refer to as the rebel flag, the United States flag, and what we have is the Israeli flag. Now, out of these three, these three flags, do you know which one that God, God Almighty, the one true God, which one did he condemn? Which one did he say is the star of the devil? It's the Israeli flag. The six-pointed star, a hexagram, used for spells, sorcery, used for evil. Acts uh, 7.43 and Amos 5.26, God Almighty called it the star of Remphan, the star of the devil. Interesting. Yeah. This is another man right here. You know, I've had a lot of trouble with, the, uh, with people on BitChute, especially back in the day. They would spam my channel. These were the Hitler people. These were the people I didn't get along with because somehow in the very beginning they thought that I was like them. I'm not like you. I don't like you. I don't have anything in common with you. Now here's a guy. <clears throat> he has a tattoo of Hitler on him. He's a, uh, he's a Nazi skinhead, whatever you want to call him. He killed his wife, killed his children, and idiots on BitChute will call him an Israelite and say that he's my white brother. You see, if you kill your wife, kill your children, kill your animals, you're not my white Israelite brother. You're a piece of shit, all right? And you wouldn't do it to a man. You see, nothing is as what it seems in our world unless you go through the Father and Jesus Christ. You know, in my time on the Internet, especially on BitChute, I've met some people that I have not liked and I'm not very liked. My channel is censored. A lot of people don't like me because... I'm not, I'm not in tune with what they do, with what they believe. I don't believe Trump is a savior. I believe he's just another pathetic, uh, pathetic politician, a, a thief, a liar, and a con who's in, who's in the hand of the Jewish politicians in the state of Israel. I don't believe Hitler was anything but a pathetic homosexual pawn. Um, he hid in a bunker. He hid in a bunker in 1945 in Berlin as women were being raped a hundred yards from them, children, little girls were being raped, little boys and men were being butchered and beat all to hell, and he hid in a bunker. Man, you can't escape that. It's the God's honest truth. I don't like the Hitler people. I don't like the Trump people. I don't get along with them. I'm not a Nazi. I don't believe. I just, if there's, it's weak. It's not of God. And there's a guy who comes to my channel. I kind of like him. His name is Cyber Gnostic. He tried to tell me one time that Hitler was a Christian. He followed God. Patrick, I like you, man, but you're delusional, and you just, you just don't, you've been taught so many lies by William Fink. God has not opened up your eyes. Let me explain it to you how, how it works, man. Hitler allowed people to worship him for 12 years. They raised their hand and said, how Hitler? No man of God would allow anybody to worship them. Patrick, you've got to have better sense than that, man. No man of God does that. The Germans people spent 12 years saying, how Hitler? How did it work out for him, man? They got bombed into oblivion. You don't understand how God works. God gave a part of himself and said, this is, going to, this is how I'm going to let your sins be taken away. And you think that God would allow a part of himself to be murdered in the form of his son and then have men say, worship me? Only a fool would believe that. When we speak of the war between the North and South, we are not speaking of two different directions, but rather of two different cultures. One of the few things they had in common was the same language, and even that was spoken with different dialects. By 1861, Southerners had developed a philosophy of independence and individual freedom, and were relatively free from governmental restraint. At the same time, the populist North embraced the notion of a strong central government, which resulted in its citizens giving up a larger measure of individuality. 
The strained attempts at holding together two cultures so diametrically opposed resulted in a disastrous war. President Jefferson Davis predicted that if the South lost the war, the North would rewrite history in its favor. And today, virtually every school system in the South teaches its students from American history books produced in the North by Northern authors. A nation that is ignorant of its past is a nation that is ripe for deception and manipulation. Therefore, it is not what happened, but rather what people believed happened which determines the present actions of a nation. In round numbers, about 250,000 colonists served during the American Revolution, of whom 10,000 were killed, a rate of 4%. During the Civil War, about 2.2 million men served in the North, of whom 360,000 died, or about 17%. About 800,000 men served in the South, of whom 260,000 perished, or 33%. In total, 620,000 died as many as in all other wars in which the United States has ever participated. It was, in a word, a bloodbath. In the spring of 1861, he was an unknown professor in a small military school in the mountains of Virginia. Two years later, his name would become a household word known throughout America and Europe. In his lifetime, Thomas Jackson achieved the status of legend. His men, his fellow commanders, and even his enemies believed in his greatness and his invincibility. Jackson drew his inspiration from God, and his faith in Jesus Christ more than anything else seems to have armored him in invincibility. His faith began when he was a boy. By the time he was a man, it was the central tenet of his life. Jackson prayed almost continually, before, during, and after battle. He delighted in attending church services, even in the field. And during his last winter, he and his chaplain, Tucker Lacey, held bi-weekly services in the camp. Jackson worried over the salvation of his men and welcomed the distribution of Bibles and tracts to his men. He said that his men should be not only good soldiers of their country, but also good soldiers of the cross. He promoted Sabbath worship among the men and even refused to mail letters that he thought would be in transit on Sunday. He disliked both war and slavery, but he believed that God had ordained the Confederacy and that his duty was simple to ensure the success of a sacred cause. It was Jackson's faith that led him to attempt and often accomplish those impossible feats that have earned him a permanent place in the annals of military history. He pushed his foot cavalry so hard that men fell asleep on the march. Yet if old Jack told them to march, they would march. They trusted him as they would an all-knowing father. In June 1842, he applied for and was appointed to West Point. Another cadet, Ulysses S. Grant, said of Jackson, He had much courage and energy, worked hard, and governed his life by stern discipline. The 59 men who graduated in the class of 1846 were among some of the best soldiers this country has ever produced. Tom Jackson struggled at the academy but was subsequently brilliant on the field. George McClellan was brilliant at the academy, but was a failure on the field. McClellan forged a deep friendship with his roommate, A.P. Hill, who would later become a Confederate general. George Pickett would lead a famous charge at Gettysburg. One member of the class of 1846 who survived the war unscathed was Confederate General Cadmus Wilcox. 
His death of natural causes in 1890 served to bind up old wounds. Four Union and four Confederate generals carried him to his grave. In the spring of 1851, Jackson was offered and accepted the appointment to teach at the Virginia Military Institute in Lexington, Virginia. He became professor of natural and experimental philosophy, which was related to modern-day physics. As his students struggled in his classes, Jackson prayed for them. When I go to my classroom and await the arrangement of the cadets in their places, that is my time to intercede with God for them. Prayer became for him a habit as natural as breathing, and he did it devoutly and continually. He once confessed to a friend, I never raise a glass of water to my lips without lifting my heart to God in thanks and prayer for the water of life. Thomas Jackson cared deeply for the local black population and helped establish a Sabbath day school in one wing of the Presbyterian Church. About 100 would gather for his lessons, and Jackson became almost a reverential figure, a white man who was emphatically the black man's friend. So completely did they trust him that two of them petitioned him to purchase them as his personal slaves. One, Albert, worked at various jobs in town to buy his freedom from Jackson. The other, Amy, served for years as his family cook and housekeeper. In August 1853, Jackson married Eleanor Junkin. Fourteen months later, Eleanor died after giving birth to a stillborn son. In July 1857, Jackson married Mary Anna Morrison. The following year, Anna gave birth to a daughter, but the baby died within a month of birth because of a liver dysfunction. Anna took the loss hard, but Jackson was more philosophical. This time, God had spared his wife. In the autumn of 1858, he bought his first and what would prove to be his only home, a two-story brick townhouse on Washington Street. Jackson did the necessary repairs on it himself, and in mid-January, the couple moved in. When the war broke out in April 1861, Jackson prayed in his parlor with Anna. Never was a prayer more fervent, tender, and touching. His voice was so choked with emotion that he could scarcely utter the words, and one of his most earnest petitions was that, if consistent with his will, God would still avert the threatening danger and grant us peace. 37-year-old Jackson was appointed a colonel of volunteers and was soon headed west to Harper's Ferry, where he organized the troops that would soon comprise the famous Stonewall Brigade. In 1824, Robert Edward Lee applied for and was appointed to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point by President James Monroe. The next year, he became a cadet at West Point. After graduation, Lee acquainted himself with Mary Randolph Custis, an eligible young lady who lived with her parents at Arlington, a mansion overlooking Washington. Mary was the great-granddaughter of Martha Washington, on June 30th, 1831, Lee, 24, and Mary, 23, were married in the Arlington Mansion. Mary would bear seven children, four daughters and three sons, and was destined to become an invalid. She was stricken with rheumatism, arthritis, and the effects of childbearing illnesses that would confine her to a wheelchair. Arlington, April 19th, 1861. Lee wrestled with the question whether to retain his command in the United States Army or to resign. Lee's wife, Mary, remembered that evening. The night his letter of resignation was to be written, he asked to be left alone for a time, and while he paced the chamber above, was heard frequently to fall upon his knees and engage in prayer for divine guidance. I waited and watched and prayed below, he came down early in the morning of April 20th, calm, collected, almost cheerful, and said he was going to write a letter of resignation to General Scott. 
On the eve of the war, Lee made it clear to whom he would turn for guidance. I fear it is now out of the power of man, and in God alone must be our trust. God is our refuge and our strength. Let us humble ourselves before him. Let us confess our sins and beseech him to give a higher courage, a purer patriotism, and a more determined will. Bishop Joseph Wilmer asked Lee how he expected to win success in such an unequal contest. At present, I am not concerned with results. My reliance is in the help of God. God's will ought to be our aim. And I am contented that His design should be accomplished, and not my own. In her diary, Mary Chestnut wrote, General Lee has been made General in Chief of Virginia. With such men to the full, we have hope. On May 23rd, federal soldiers occupied Arlington. They made sure the Lees would never again live in the house by burying soldiers in the yard adjacent to the house. Today, it is the focal point of Arlington National Cemetery. General Irvin McDowell was commander of more than 30,000 Union forces encamped in and around the Washington area. Finally, on July 16th, at Lincoln's insistence, McDowell launched a campaign to take Richmond. But along the way, he would take Manassas, a railroad junction 20 miles southwest of Washington. By noon, Jackson's brigade was on the march to Manassas, 57 miles southeast. In the afternoon of July 20th, Jackson reported to Beauregard, who then ordered Jackson's brigade into a pine thicket three miles away. Jackson's men were among some 20,000 Confederate forces scattered through the northern Virginia farm country and dug in around a stream called Bull Run. Also waiting were civilian families who had gone to the vicinity with their picnic baskets, ready to enjoy the spectacle of a grand and decisive Union victory. The Union forces kept pressing their offensive on both Confederate flanks, forcing the Southerners to fall back to a small rise in the area known as Henry Hill. High ground was still in southern hands, but barely. If the South lost the hill, they would almost certainly lose the battle. Jackson moved his line to the cover of a pine glen on top of the wide hill and positioned a nine-gun artillery force. He then moved Stuart's cavalry into position along his weak left flank. Union artillery was soon bombarding Jackson's position. When General B saw how Jackson was taking control of his position, he became inspired and galloped back to his men where he delivered one of the most famous lines of the war. Look, men, there stands Jackson like a stone wall. Rally behind the Virginians. That afternoon, McDowell made his final grand move, a frontal assault up Henry Hill. Jackson ordered his men to counterattack with their bayonets and to yell like furies. Additional reinforcements soon arrived, and they swept down on the Union's right. Shortly before 5 p.m., McDowell admitted defeat and ordered a retreat. The civilians also began to flee in their carriages and buggies. Ted Barkley described the retreating army in a letter to his family. They left hats, coats, canteens, and jumped the fence and did not stop until they got to Alexandria. The following day, Jackson wrote to his wife, Anna. Yesterday, we fought a great battle and gained a great victory. 
for which all the glory is due to God alone. To his minister, Jackson wrote a letter of apology. My dear pastor, in my tent last night after a fatiguing day's service, I remember that I had failed to send you my contribution for our colored Sunday school. Enclosed, you will find a check for that object. July 21st, 1861, after the First Battle of Manassas, Lee wrote to Mary, Do not grieve for the brave dead, nor have sorrow for those they left behind. The former are at rest. The latter must suffer. I hope God will again smile on us and strengthen our hearts and arms. Lee's daughter Annie had become ill in North Carolina and died on October 20th, 1862. Lee tried to comfort his wife. Dear Mary, I cannot express the anguish I feel at the death of our sweet Annie. To know that I shall never see her again on earth is agonizing in the extreme. But God in this, as in all things, has mingled mercy with the blow in selecting that one best prepared to leave us. May you be able to join me in saying, His will be done. Lee also wrote his son Custis. The death of my dear Annie was indeed to me a bitter pang. But the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In October 1861, Jackson set up headquarters in Winchester, which had a population of about 4,000 and was the pivotal northern gateway to the 150-mile-long Shenandoah Valley. Stonewall was charged with defending both Winchester and the valley. In a 10-week period, he brought his valley campaign to a successful close. In that time, he had marched his men almost 700 miles. He had kept 50,000 Union troops occupied and away from Richmond, with a force only one-third that size. In the Northern press, he had become the scourge of the Union, the rebel Napoleon. To the South, he was the indomitable Stone Wall the only truly victorious general they had. But to him, no glory was personal. It all belonged to God. He confided to one clergyman that he often went to the woods to pace and pray. I was at first annoyed that I was compelled to keep my eyes open to avoid running against the trees and stumps. But having consulted the scriptures, I find no requirements to close our eyes in prayer. Reverend Ewing once described Jackson's prayer life. During his prayers, his tones were deep, solemn, and tremulous. He seemed to realize that he was speaking to heaven's king and seemed to feel more than any man I'd ever known the danger of robbing God of the glory due for our success. A Union surgeon said, if Stonewall Jackson ever gets so completely surrounded that he cannot march or fight his way out, he will take wings unto himself and his army and fly out. And a Union officer said, Stonewall Jackson's men will follow him to the devil, and he knows it. In late June, McClellan sat outside Richmond with 100,000 well-supplied troops. He was so close to Richmond that his troops could hear the church bells ring. Lee had 50,000, plus Jackson's 18,000 ill-fed men in threadbare uniforms. Jeb Stewart and his cavalry made a hundred-mile sweep around McClellan. He told Lee that the northern end of McClellan's line was exposed. A flanking movement by the Confederates could easily break it. Lee now informed his generals of his plan to launch an offensive on McClellan. July 1st, Jackson's column drew close to Malvern Hill. Only to fall instantly in a hail of Union fire.
fighting continued through the evening and into the night. Finally, at 10 p.m., the guns were silenced. But the moaning of wounded filled the darkness. Kid Douglas remembered. The dark and dismal night began to settle upon the battlefield. The howling of the storm, the cry of the wounded, and the groans of the dying could be heard by all. Through the morning mist, a federal officer also remembered that night. Dead and wounded men were on the ground in every attitude of distress. A third of them were dead or dying, but enough were alive and moving to give to the field a singular crawling effect. Upon leaving a council of war one night, General Ewell discovered that he had left his sword behind. Upon returning, he found Jackson on his knees in prayer. He was so deeply moved by what he heard and saw, he said, if that is religion, I must have it. On an earlier occasion, Ewell had remarked, Jackson is as crazy as a March hare. But this appraisal drastically changed when Ewell later made a profession of faith in Christ. He said that he owed much to the influence of Stonewall Jackson's example. The Seven Days Campaign was at an end. Both sides suffered heavy losses. But McClellan had failed to take Richmond. During the Second Battle of Manassas in 1862, Lee's 48,000 men were facing the overwhelming army of General Pope, which numbered 75,000. Stonewall took 20,000 of Lee's men and in two days marched them 51 miles up and around the right flank of Pope's army and destroyed his base of operations. A year before, Jackson had made his legendary Stonewall stand here, and he would do it again. Together, he and Longstreet could catch the recruiting enemy in a vice. I came upon Jackson positioned near a line of fire, writing dispatches, while cannon shot fell around Jackson and covered his papers with dust. The general remained undisturbed. To the Yankees, it was beginning to seem that Jackson was everywhere. I don't like Jackson's movements. He will suddenly appear when least expected. General George McClellan. In her diary, Mary Chestnut wrote, Stonewall cannot be everywhere though he comes near it. Stonewall's legend was growing even larger. He had, in the words of one Richmond paper, become the most remarkable man in the history of war. To his wife, Jackson wrote, We can express the grateful conviction that God was with us and gave to the victory, and unto his holy name be the praise. Jackson and his men were again on the move through the Maryland night. They were exhausted. Jackson himself had not slept in two days. By late morning on September 16th, the first of Jackson's column filed into Sharpsburg. Lee positioned Jackson's brigade on his left flank near Dunker Church, so named because of its practice of full immersion baptism. 40,000 Southern troops were pitted against the 87,000-man Federal Army of the Potomac under General George McClellan. On September 17th, the sun inched up and spread across the farm country.
10,000 Federals came at Jackson's line through a cornfield. Within minutes, hundreds had fallen, and within an hour, the field was the scene of horrific carnage. General Joseph Hooker wrote, Every stalk of corn in the northern and greater part of the field was cut as closely as could have been done with a knife, and the slain lay in rows, precisely as they had stood in their ranks a few moments before. At 9 a.m., with Jackson's line strained to the breaking point, Union troops struck again near Dunker Church, but they were massacred by converging Confederates. For nearly four hours, from 9.30 in the morning to 1 p.m., fighting raged along an old sunken road, later known as Bloody Lane. In mid-afternoon, Union troops under General Burnside blasted Lee's right flank. Lee's line would have crumbled, but General A.P. Hill arrived from Harper's Ferry with reinforcements and immediately entered the fight. Burnside's troops were driven back, and the Battle of Antietam was over. Antietam would be remembered as the single bloodiest day in the history of American warfare. 12,400 Federals and 10,700 Confederates lay dead or wounded. By the third week of November, Union forces were filing into Fredericksburg, a quiet city of 5,000 inhabitants nestled along the Rappahannock River. Its strategic location midway between Richmond and Washington caused it to become a focal point of the war. The residents of Fredericksburg had fled into the cold countryside. Lincoln had replaced McClellan with Burnside, and Lee was worried that the Northern authorities might continue to make changes until they found someone he didn't understand. The combined forces of Jackson, Lee, and Longstreet numbered over 72,000 men. Confederate infantrymen were standing in a sunken road and concealed from view by a stone wall. On December 13th, Burnside began the first of 14 frontal assaults, resulting in the loss of 12,000 men, compared to 5,300 for the South. Lee said during the fighting, it is well that war is so terrible. We should grow too fond of it. As night settled above the river, the temperatures dropped and corpses froze against the earth. One South Carolina private could not ignore the moans of the dying enemy and went to give them water. For his kindness, 19-year-old Sergeant Richard Kirkland became known as the Angel of Mary's Heights. During that long winter, Anna was longing to see her husband again, so Jackson wrote her explaining why he couldn't. Whilst it would be a great comfort to see you and my little daughter, duty appears to require me to remain with my command. As my officers and soldiers are not permitted to go see their wives and families, I ought not to see my Esposita, as it might make the troops feel that they were badly treated and that I consult my own pleasure and comfort regardless of this. On April 27, 1863, Anna attended a prayer meeting at her husband's headquarters. There, she met Lee for the first time. I remember how reverent and impressive was General Lee's baron, and how splendid he looked in faultless military attire. General Lee was always charming in the society of ladies, 
and often indulged in a playful way of teasing them that was quite amusing. He claimed the privilege of kissing all the pretty young girls, which was regarded by them as a special honor. Lincoln had now replaced Burnside with fighting Joe Hooker. Jackson knew the name was well-deserved. He had come up against Hooker at 2nd Manassas and again at Antietam. Hooker had devised a plan he believed foolproof. He was going to flank Lee and squeeze the Army of Northern Virginia in a vast pincher movement. Hooker had the numbers to do it, nearly 134,000 men, which was over twice the size of the Southern strength. 50,000 Union troops would occupy Lee's attention with a feinting maneuver downstream, while his advancing Column 5 Corps converged at the Chancellorsville crossroads on Lee's unsuspecting left flank. But he soon guessed at Hooker's plan. Lee ordered Major Richard Anderson's division to move west toward Chancellorsville and deter any enemy advance. Jackson was to reinforce Anderson. Jackson ordered a two-pronged offensive, one along the plank road, the other along the turnpike. Hooker suddenly lost his nerve. To the astonishment of his officers, Fighting Joe ordered them to fall back to Chancellorsville and dig earthworks. He was putting his massive force on the defensive. In the evening, Lee and Jackson had a meeting. Neither could understand what Hooker was up to, but Jackson was convinced that Hooker had lost his nerve and would withdraw across the Rappahannock before morning. Lee was not so optimistic. As they talked, Jeb Stewart arrived with encouraging news. Hooker's right flank was exposed and vulnerable. The news inspired a plan that would become historic. Jackson would lead his corps on a risky 12-mile march around the Union Army and destroy Hooker's right flank in a spectacular surprise attack. The morning of May 2nd, the Second Corps was roused and the men were soon on the march. In mid-afternoon, Jackson crested a knoll that gave him a view down on Federal forces who were relaxed and unprepared. Jackson wrote to Lee his final dispatch from the field. I hope as soon as practical to attack. I trust that an ever kind providence will bless us with great success. Two hours later, 21,000 Confederates formed a line that extended a mile on either side of the road. A bugle call announced the attack. Suddenly, a stampede of rabbits, deer, and foxes rushed through the camps. The bluecoats were amused by the animal onrush, but not alarmed. The men were eating supper, and a band was playing in a pine grove. Then the searing rebel yell pierced the woods. By 6.30 that evening, Jackson had achieved his objective. That evening, in the moonlight, Jackson moved up the plank road and considered his options for a continued attack. Eight officers were with him, as well as 19-year-old David Kyle, who had grown up in the area and was acting as a guide. All of a sudden, gunfire broke out around Jackson and his party. There was a skirmish between the 33rd North Carolina and a Pennsylvania regiment, and Stonewall was caught in the middle. Stonewall Jackson was struck immediately by three 57 caliber bullets, one below the left shoulder, another in the left forearm, and another in the right hand. Four of Jackson's party lay dead, and Jackson himself was critically wounded. Jackson was eased onto a stretcher and the bearers lifted him on their shoulders. A Union artillery shell hit one of the men and Jackson fell five feet to the ground. They put him back on the stretcher and carried him to the safety of the woods. But one of the men tripped and Jackson hit the ground again, this time on the broken arm. The two falls had done serious damage and a torn artery was gushing blood. 
Jackson's physician, Dr. Hunter McGuire, with the help of three surgeons, amputated the general's left arm. When Lee heard of Jackson's decline, he declared, give General Jackson my affectionate regards and say to him, he has lost his left arm, but I my right. Mr. Lacey, the minister, came to see Jackson. I am not depressed or unhappy, for my heavenly Father has pledged all things to work together for good to them that love him. I am sure this is for my good, and if I am not permitted to see now, then I am content to await the full explanation in heaven. On May 4th, Jackson was moved to the overseer's office that stood on the grounds near the home of the Chandler family. A few days later, Dr. McGuire went to see Jackson. What he found were soaked sheets. Jackson was succumbing to pneumonia. That afternoon, his wife Anna came to his bedside. Jackson asked McGuire for his prognosis, and McGuire was honest. Stonewall then replied, if it is his will, I am ready to go. I am not afraid to die. On the night of May 9th, Anna and her brother serenaded him with his favorite hymns. Anna wrote later, The singing had a quiet an effect, and he seemed to rest in perfect peace. And makes my joys complete. The following day was Sunday. Throughout the day, Anna assured her husband. Before the day is out, you will be with your blessed Savior in his glory. It is the Lord's day. My wish is fulfilled. I have always desired to die on a Sunday. McGuire attempted to offer him brandy for the pain, but Jackson would not have it. It will only delay my departure. I want to preserve my mind, if possible, to the end. The end came at 3.15 in the afternoon of Sunday, May 10th, 1863. Thomas Jackson sank into unconsciousness, murmuring his last words, which have become immortalized. Let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. Let us cross over that shining river and rest neath the shade of the trees. Fly away on the Sabbath, O oh day of rest and gladness for all. General Lee wrote his wife, I know not how to replace him. God's will be done. There is a promise, a sure foundation on which unshaken I stood that to those who love and serve transported the entourage to Richmond, 
where the largest crowd in the city's history was gathered. Stretching for two miles along the tracks, mourners wept and waved at the passing train as church bells rang throughout the city. Jackson's remains lay in the capital as some 20,000 people came to pay their respects. The time had come to close the door against the multitudes that still clamored to enter. But an old one-armed soldier began pressing forward. He was told that he was too late to see the body. The casket was being closed for the last time, and the order had been given to clear the hall. Tears were streaming down his face as he exclaimed, By this arm which I lost for my country, I demand the privilege of seeing my general once more. Governor Letcher, Jackson's friend and admirer, intervened and granted the old man's request. Stonewall Jackson, age 39, was laid to rest in Lexington, Virginia. Mary Chestnut wrote in her diary the description of a Yankee cartoon. Angels were sent down from heaven to bear up Stonewall's soul. They could not find it and flew back in sorrow. But when they got to the Golden Gate above, they found that Stonewall, by a rapid flank movement, had already cut a way in. Jackson's cherished Esposita, Anna, became known as the widow of the Confederacy and beloved by the entire South. To the end of her life, she remained a symbol of the Confederacy and was hailed wherever she went. In her 83 years, she met five U.S. presidents, including Teddy Roosevelt. After visiting her, Roosevelt proclaimed that the greeting that pleased and touched him more than any other came when he was greeted by the widow of Stonewall Jackson. Anna never remarried because, as she said, she did not want to give up her last name, Jackson. As to the Stonewall Brigade, it became the only unit to have its nickname officially recognized by the Confederate War Department. These men battled proudly on, fighting at Gettysburg as well as other campaigns. At the end of the war, these men surrendered with Lee's forces at Appomattox in April 1865. After the Battle of Chancellorsville, Lee gave a congratulatory address to the Army. While this glorious victory entitles you to the praises and gratitude of the nation, we are especially called upon to return our grateful thanks to the only giver of victory for the single deliverance he wrought. It is therefore earnestly recommended that the troops unite on Sunday next in ascribing unto the Lord of the hosts the glory due unto his name. Lee was now launching another raid northward into Pennsylvania. On June 30th, the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac touched by chance at Gettysburg. The opening battle began on July 1st with the Confederate Army attacking Union troops on McPherson Ridge, west of town. On July 2nd, the battle lines were drawn up in two sweeping arcs. The main portions of both armies were nearly one mile apart on parallel ridges. Union forces on Cemetery Ridge and Confederate forces on Seminary Ridge to the west. Lee ordered an attack against both Union flanks. James Longstreet's thrust on the Federal left turned the base of Little Round Top into a shambles and left the area strewn with dead and wounded. On July 3rd, Lee's artillery opened a two-hour bombardment against the Federal lines on Cemetery Hill. 
Then, some 12,000 Confederates began a one-mile advance across open fields toward the Federal Center in an attack known as Pickett's Charge. There were more than 5,000 casualties in one hour. With the repulse of Pickett's charge, the Battle of Gettysburg was over. The Army of Northern Virginia had lost a devastating 28,000 men, about one-third of their force while Meade lost 23,000, about one-fourth of his effective force. On August 13, 1863, Lee issued the following order. The President of the Confederate States has, in the name of the people, appointed August 21st as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. All military duties, except such as are absolutely necessary, will be suspended. Soldiers, we have sinned against Almighty God. We have forgotten His single mercies and have cultivated a revengeful, haughty, and boastful spirit. We have not remembered that the defenders of a just cause should be pure in His eyes. God is our only refuge and our strength. Chaplain J. William Jones wrote, I can never forget the effect produced by the reading of this order at the solemn services of that memorable fast day. The work of grace among the troops widened and deepened and went gloriously on until over 15,000 soldiers professed repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ as his personal savior. How far these results were due to this fast day or to the quiet influence and fervent prayers of the commanding general, eternity alone shall reveal. Mine Run, November 1863. The Army of Northern Virginia confronted Union General Meade, and an attack was imminent. General Lee, along with a number of officers, was riding down the line of battle when they came upon a party of soldiers engaged in a prayer meeting. As shooting along the skirmish line began, Lee saw these men bowed in prayer. He instantly dismounted, uncovered his head, and devoutly joined in the simple worship. The rest of the party followed his example, and those humble privates found themselves leading the devotions of their loved and honored General Lee. Lee's son, Rooney, was imprisoned at Fort Monroe. And on December 26th, Lee received a horrifying telegram announcing the death of Rooney's wife, Charlotte. Lee wrote Mary. It has pleased God to take from us one exceedingly dear to us, and we must be resigned to his holy will. What a glorious thought it is that she has joined her little cherubs and our angel Annie in heaven. Thus link by link is the strong chain broken that binds us to earth and smooths our passage to another world. Lee also wrote to his son, How I mourn her loss, but my grief is for ourselves, not for her. She is brighter and happier than ever, safe from all evil and awaiting us in her heavenly abode. May God in his mercy enable us to join her in eternal praise to our Lord and Savior. May 29, 1864, after spending five days trying to dislodge the Confederates from their positions, Grant moved his army southeast around Lee's right flank. But Lee responded quickly, and on May 31st, Grant moved yet further southwards to an isolated crossroads called Cold Harbor. So called because the restaurant there did not serve hot meals. 
Cold Harbor was only nine miles from Richmond. While the Southerners prepared a new line of defense, Grant threw his tired troops against them, but was again rebuffed. He decided on one more all-out attack. The assault was to be one of the most costly of the war. In half an hour, Grant suffered 7,000 casualties, nearly five times those of the South. It was the fastest rate of killing in any Civil War battle. Bodies were stacked up in front of the rebel trenches like cordwood, and the firing was so severe that Lee later remarked that it had sounded like sheets ripping in the wind. It was aptly said that this was not war, but murder. The South had won one of its easiest victories, while the North had suffered one of its heaviest and most pointless defeats. Grant's determination had turned into his bloodiest mistake. He acquired the reputation of being Butcher Grant, ironically from the lips of many of the same people who had recently been praising him to the skies. Most everyone agreed North and South that he was no match for Robert E. Lee. August 1864. After the fall of Atlanta, the infamous Northern General William Tecumseh Sherman declared war on the civilian population of the South. He proclaimed that women and children must be made to feel the war as heavily as the soldier in the field. Thousands of Southerners died as a result of the deliberate shelling of civilian targets, the blockade of civilian medical supplies, and the burning of civilian homes. Starvation became prevalent because of the deliberate destruction of civilian food supplies. Sherman continued burning virtually everything from Atlanta to the sea in a 60-mile wide by 300-mile long path. Sherman and his army destroyed homes, schools, churches, and entire communities. Today, you can fly over this region and see the patterns of growth and buildings that outline Sherman's devastating march path. Scores of Negro women were viciously assaulted by regiments of Yankees. White women, likewise, were left to the mercy of unbridled Yankee soldiers, while their husbands and fathers were dying on the war front. As he marched through Georgia, scores of blacks followed him. Pontoon bridges were used to get his army across the many rivers. After taking up the bridges, many blacks were stranded on the other side, where they were captured. In her diary, Mary Chestnut called Sherman a nightmare, a ghoul, and a hyena. An officer under Sherman's command wrote of his disgust in a letter. I tell you the truth when I say that we are about as mean a mob as ever walked the face of the earth. It is perfectly frightful. If I lived in this country, I never would lay down my arms while a Yankee remained on the soil. I do not blame Southerners for being secessionists now. I could relate many things that would be laughable if they were not so horribly disgraceful. Sherman's march to the sea was in sharp contrast to Lee's Pennsylvania campaign, where he issued the following order to his army. The commanding general considers that no greater disgrace could befall the army than the perpetration of the barbarous outrages upon the innocent and defenseless and the wanton destruction of private property that have marked the course of the enemy in our own country. It must be remembered that we make war only upon armed men. 
We cannot take vengeance for the wrongs our people have suffered without lowering ourselves in the eyes of all whose abhorrence has been excited by the atrocities of our enemy, and defending against him to whom vengeance belongs, without whose favor and support our efforts must prove in vain. When Lee took 75,000 men into Pennsylvania, renowned historian Clifford Dowdy wrote that not a single house was burned in the enemy's land. A British observer made note of the good behavior of the Southern troops, writing that he saw none of the inhabitants disturbed or annoyed by the soldiers. During the final year of the war, there was much despair. However, one thing had become clear. Robert Edward Lee now symbolized more than anyone or anything else the whole of the Confederate cause. His health during this period was relatively good and he remained active at his various headquarters around Petersburg. Walter Taylor wrote, It is quite trying to accompany the general to church or any public place. Everybody crowds the way and stops to have a look. Revival in the Southern armies continued until the very end of the war. Even in the early months of 1865, as the desperate struggle around Petersburg, Virginia drew to a close, preaching services took place twice every Sunday for the soldiers. January 1865, the end finally came for Confederate officials and their families in Richmond. Led by Davis, they fled southward by train. An evacuation fire that was meant to burn military supplies raged out of control, ultimately burning one-third of the city. A servant in front of a house where the fire seemed to be headed hailed a Union aide. When the aide stopped, he was met by a lady who stated that her mother was an invalid and was confined to her bed. Since the fire was approaching, she explained her need for assistance. In the subsequent conversation, he discovered that the invalid was no other than Mary, the wife of General Robert E. Lee, and the lady who addressed the aide was her daughter. Two Union soldiers guarded them until all danger was past. Exhausted from poor supplies and lack of sleep, Lee and his remaining 50,000 men headed south but Grant intercepted the possible retreat routes and cut off the much-needed supplies. Lee's army marched west toward Farmville, where they would find rations. On April 6th at Sailor's Creek, the Yankees caught up with Lee's rear guard and took 8,000 prisoners, including six general officers, among them Lee's son Custis and Richard Ewell. Lee then spoke the words which signaled the end of the conflict. There is nothing left for me to do but go and see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. The famous meeting between Lee and Grant took place on Palm Sunday, April 9th, 1865. The location was the Wilmer McLean House in the tiny village of Appomattox Courthouse. Lee had been up since 3 a.m., he dressed in his finest, and last, gray uniform, and then mounted traveler. Sergeant G.W. Tucker carried a white flag, and Colonel Charles Marshall rode along as an aide. Union General Officer Joshua Chamberlain described his first vision of Lee. I turned about, and there behind me, riding in between my two lines, appeared a commanding form, superbly mounted, richly accoutred, with expression of deep sadness, overmastered by deeper strength. It was no other than Robert E. Lee. I sat immovable, with a certain awe and admiration. It was about 1.30 in the afternoon before Grant arrived. He had not slept. His clothes were soiled and dusty, and his boots were mud-spattered. 
The surrender interview lasted until about 3.45 p.m. The federal commander offered generous terms, allowing all Confederates to be paroled and return home, keeping their horses, sidearms, and baggage. After signing the surrender papers, Lee shook hands with Grant and walked out onto the porch. Federal officers immediately came to attention and saluted Lee. Lee returned the salute and mounted Traveler. As he rode quietly down the lane, he passed into view of his men. In an instant, they were about him, with tears flowing down their faces. One of the Southern soldiers, William Blackford, wrote his parents. When the soldiers saw General Lee approaching, there was a general rush from each side of the road to greet him as he passed. And two solid walls of men were formed along the whole distance. Wild, heartfelt cheers arose, which so touched General Lee that tears filled his eyes and trickled down his cheeks as he rode, hat in hand, bowing his acknowledgments. Lee wrote an official letter to the troops. I earnestly pray that a merciful God will extend to you his blessing and protection. I bid you an affectionate farewell. On April 12th, Lee returned to his house in Richmond. A few days after his return, the celebrated Yankee photographer Matthew Brady convinced the general to pose for a series of photographs on the rear porch of the Lee house. His son Custis and his aide Walter Taylor joined Lee in the photo session. Walter Taylor had joined Lee's staff in the spring of 1861 and remained with him throughout the war. He was in closer daily contact with Lee than any other officer and was with him at Appomattox. He rose to the grade of Lieutenant Colonel. At the close of the war, offers of financial assistance poured upon him from all quarters, but he steadfastly refused them. An insurance company offered him their presidency at a salary of $10,000 a year. When he declined the offer, they replied, but General, you need not perform any duties. We simply want the use of your name. That will abundantly compensate us. Excuse me, sir. I cannot consent to receive pay for services I do not render. My good name is about all that I have saved from the wreck of the war. And that is not for sale. Dear Mary, life is indeed gliding away. And I have nothing good to show for mine that is past. I pray I may be spared to accomplish something for the benefit of mankind and the honor of God. God answered Lee's prayer. The Board of Trustees at a little school named Washington College in Lexington, Virginia, offered him the college presidency. He accepted in early September and began plans to move his family to the charming little town of Lexington where Stonewall Jackson lay buried. During General Lee's administration of five years, the college expanded from 146 students the first year to 344 students the fifth. The prosperity of the college was due to his influence and had attracted young men from every state. But the trustees were always faced with the refusal of General Lee to receive a salary beyond what he conceived the college could afford. His salary of $1,500 per year was modest in comparison to some ex-generals on both sides who capitalized on their fame. They simply wanted to compensate him for his invaluable service. But his firm reply was always the same. My salary is as large as the college ought to pay. He urged that a chapel be built on the campus there were other objects that required a great outlay of money, but he deemed the chapel of great importance. The building was completed in time for June 1868 commencement exercises. Lee's office was in the basement, and he worshipped upstairs daily. The Reverend Struther Jones told the following story. 
On one occasion, I noticed that Lee was deeply affected after his daily prayers in the chapel. I asked, what's the matter, General? To which he replied, I was thinking of my responsibility to Almighty God for these hundreds of young men. On another occasion, Professor Thomas Kirkpatrick had a conversation with Lee. We had been conversing for some time respecting the religious welfare of the students. General Lee's feelings soon became so intense that for a time his utterance was choked. But recovering himself, with his eyes overflowing with tears, his lips quivering with emotion, he exclaimed, Oh, doctor, if I could only know that all the young men in this college were good Christians, I should have nothing more to desire. The trustees were anxious to build a residence for him, but he insisted that other buildings were needed far more than a new house for himself. The trustees finally made the appropriation without his knowledge. He then supervised the building himself, reducing its cost considerably. The house featured a first floor bedroom and a porch that was built on three sides for Mary, so that she could enjoy greater mobility in her wheelchair. The Lees were careful to speak of it, not as their own, but as the president's house. One of the university faculty had been criticizing General Grant with some harsh words. General Lee told him emphatically, Sir, if you ever presume again to speak disrespectfully of General Grant in my presence, either you or I will sever his connection with this university. Lee's Christian character was so highly regarded in England that several English admirers sent him a Bible. He wrote them a letter of acknowledgement. The Bible is a book in comparison with which all others in my eyes are of minor importance and which in all my perplexities has never failed to give me light and strength. He accepted the presidency of the Rockbridge Bible Society and continued to discharge its duties until the time of his death. In an address in 1869, Chaplain William Jones stated that the great need of our colleges was a genuine, pervasive revival and that it could only come from God. At the close of the meeting, General Lee came to him. I wish, sir, to thank you for your address. It was just what we needed. My great desire is a revival that brings these young men to Christ. We poor sinners need to come back from our wanderings to seek pardon through the all-sufficient merits of our Redeemer. And we need to pray earnestly for the power of the Holy Spirit to give us a precious revival in our hearts and among the unconverted. Dr. William Jones relates the following story. One day in the autumn of 1869, I saw General Lee talking to a humbly clad man. Later when I inquired to his identity, the general said, that was one of our soldiers. I took it for granted that he meant it was a Confederate veteran and asked to what command he belonged. General Lee pleasantly responded, he fought on the other side, but we must not remember that against him now. The man afterward came to my house and said, sir, he is the noblest man that ever lived. He not only had a kind word for an old soldier who fought against him, but he gave me some money to help me on my way. During the summer months, Lee's rheumatism became more bothersome. On September 28, 1870, he walked home in a downpour of rain after a routine day. Mary, confined to a wheelchair, smiled and teased her husband. You have kept us waiting a long time. Where have you been? Lee did not answer. He took his place at the table and stood to say grace. The effort was in vain. The lips could not utter the prayer of the heart. Finding himself unable to speak, he quietly took his seat. The doctor was called, and Lee was put to bed in front of a living room window where he had liked to sit and look out. The following week, a storm beat across the countryside. 
But Lee was not aware of the prolonged storm. His mind had gone free, past the ramparts of rain and flood. When his son, General Custis Lee, made some allusion to his recovery, he shook his head and pointed upward. The end came on the morning of October 12th, 1870. At his bedside were his wife, Mary, son, Custis, and daughters, Agnes and Mildred. Lee's voice suddenly filled the room. Strike the tent. Tell Hill he must come up. Lee had given his last order to move on. The great commander closed his eyes and his soul passed peacefully from Earth. He was 63 years old. Mary died three years later at age 65. Robert E. Lee was buried beneath the chapel and in 1883 re-entombed in the Lee family crypt inside Lee Chapel. At his burial, the congregation sang his favorite hymn, How Firm a Foundation, Ye Saints of the Lord. Irish orator said, the solitude of George Washington was broken as Lee crossed the threshold of heaven. Chaplain J. William Jones said, if I have ever come in contact with a sincere, devout Christian, one who seeing himself to be a sinner, trusted alone in the merits of Christ, that man was General Robert E. Lee. The London Standard wrote, truer greatness, a loftier nature, a spirit more merciful, a character purer, more chivalrous, the world has rarely, if ever, known. The New York Herald wrote, he came nearer the ideal of a soldier and Christian general than any man we can think of. And the Washington College student newspaper wrote, he died as he lived, calmly and quietly, in the full assurance of the Christian faith, and with the brightest evidence that in passing over the river, he has rested under the shade of the trees of paradise. Even Northern officers began to sing the praises of General Lee. John C. Ropes wrote, no commander on either side was so universally believed in and so absolutely trusted. Nor was there ever a commander who better deserved the support of his government and the affection of his soldiers. The year following Lee's death, the name of Washington College was changed to Washington and Lee University. In that same year, Lee's son Custis succeeded his father as president and he served in that capacity for 26 years. Rooney recovered from wounds he received during the war and served as president of the Virginia Agricultural Society. In 1887, he was elected to Congress, serving until his death in 1891. Rob died in 1914. None of Lee's four daughters ever married. Great military leaders would continue to journey from Europe to the United States to study firsthand the tactics Lee had used against better equipped and more numerous forces. They praised him as the greatest military genius of the century. One military man said, Lee's campaigns of 1862 are, quote, supreme in conception and have not been surpassed as examples of strategy by any other commander in history, end of quote. Not long after the war, a northern soldier told of meeting Lee in the field at Gettysburg. In the opinion of the producer of this documentary, 
Nothing exemplifies the character of Robert E. Lee better than his story. I have been a most bitter anti-South man and fought and cursed the Confederates desperately. I could see nothing good in any of them. The last day of the fight, I was badly wounded as a ball had shattered my left leg. I lay on the ground not far from Cemetery Ridge, and as General Lee ordered his retreat, he and his officers rode near me. As they came along, I recognized him, and though faint from exposure and loss of blood, I raised my hands and looked Lee in the face and shouted as loud as I could, Hurrah for the Union! Hurrah for the Union! The general heard me, looked, stopped his horse, dismounted, and came toward me. I confess I at first thought he meant to kill me. But as he came up, he looked down at me with such a sad expression on his face that all fear left me, and I wondered what he was about. He extended his hand to me, grasping mine firmly, and looking right into my eyes, said, My son, I hope you will soon be well. If I live a thousand years, I shall never forget the expression on General Lee's face. There he was, defeated, retiring from a field that had cost him and his cause almost their last hope, and yet he stopped to say words like these to a wounded soldier of the opposition who had taunted him as he passed by. As soon as the general left me, I cried myself to sleep there on the bloody ground. Thank you.